One very effective tool, and this is actually in use in China, pretty widespread now, is if people have a hard time focusing, remember that that cognitive or mental focus follows visual focus. So if you're going to sit down and do some work and you find, oh, like, I can't concentrate, I'm not, I'm not I'm like getting it, I can't get into the writing or I can't do what I'm doing. Very simple practice, it's been tested. You can take a piece of paper, um, put a little crosshatch on it, put it at the distance of your computer and force yourself to bring your vision, what we call a virgin's eye movement, to that location and try and hold that, blinking as seldom as possible as you can for about 60 seconds. You've now adjusted the aperture of your visual field, but you've also changed the aperture of your thinking, right, in doing that. And this is very different than if you were just to concentrate on like the feeling of touch on the tips of your fingers, because as you do work, most all work requires vision. And then the work that you do, you'll find exists in this kind of narrow tunnel and you're able to rule out distractions quite a bit better. That's one of the reasons why this device is so terrible. I mean, I fall victim to this too, but if you have your phone every two seconds, you're looking at your phone, your visual attention is darting all over the place. So there's a lot of, of clinically legitimate, if you will, ADHD that we've brought up on ourselves. Um, and so you can use visual focus as a, as a training tool. Yeah. Um, I, I have a simple meditation I do in the morning. I call it a meditation, but it's really just visual training. I can explain it now. I don't think I've described this anywhere that anchors several of these practices. I actually will close my eyes and just concentrate on my internal state, something we call interoception, and I'll just breathe three times. Then I'll open my eyes, I'll stare at my hand or something at about a distance of, of arm's length, and I'll focus my visual attention there and breathe three times just for um, sake of timekeeping. Then I'll look at foot in the distance and I'll do the same. And then I try and go into panoramic vision, even if I'm indoors, and I'll breathe three times. And then I bring myself right back into my internal landscape. I'll focus on a little crosshatch and usually then I get to work. And so what am I doing? What is this wacky practice? Well, this wacky uh, practice I just described is stepping through each, as we call, it sounds uh, abstract, but space-time bin of the visual system. The visual system can orient to now, it can orient to the future, it can orient to the past, mostly to the present and future. And so this stepping through a visual attention systematically, what I'm doing is I'm training my system to adjust to these shifts because throughout the day, life is a series of shifts between one thing and the next and the next, and the, the ability to transition between these and then lock into them and then transition into the next is what makes us effective. And I, this might seem a little abstract, but if you try it, what you'll find is that transitions between, say, work and a conversation or um, dropping into work very deeply become much easier. And there's, there's, reason, there's neurobiological underpinnings to this. Um, it's, this is a forced practice. It's, it kind of mimics what we ought to be doing all day long. The problem is, is that the interference of, of mostly of smartphone communications is that we're constantly being bombarded with cont new context after new context. That's what's really, I don't think there's a, as much problem with the content on social media, although that's a debate, you know, there's uh, there too. Obviously you want to protect kids and so forth, except that when you're on social media, it's the equivalent of watching 50 movies in two minutes because you're scrolling through and context switch, context switch, context switch. The, the human brain has never been confronted with this. Even if you have 200 channels on the television, it's very rare to just go channel, channel, channel. Yeah. The whole idea of social media, and by the way, I, I obviously I t participate, I teach on social media, and I consume social media, but you're just, you're context switching, context switching, context switching in a, in a very passive way. And so what I've tried to do is create practices that are grounded in the neurobiology of vision and how vision anchors attention and, and can induce calm. And that, the practice, that simple uh, practice I describe. What it does is it, it gives you the power and control to shift your visual attention to different things as opposed to some external stimulus shifting your visual attention for you. And, it, um, and I find it, I've been doing this for about eight years now. I do it every morning and sometimes in the afternoon. And what I find is that it's allowed me to be far more effective in the activities that I'm engaged in and transitioning between those activities. And my lab's looking at this as a, a, from the you know experimental um, perspective, but I just thought I'd put the tool out there because again, it's zero cost. There's yeah, by all means, being no. safe, et cetera. No. I love it. It, it, it kind of sounds like training a muscle in the gym is gonna allow us to, well, do many things, but lift heavier things, be more strong and robust in our life for whatever we're trying to do. And 
it sounds like this kind of four part process of, you know, focusing on, you know, things at different distances, it, it, it kind of feels to me as though this is a process that's helping adapt our visual systems to the way the modern world is now, because the modern world ain't changing any time soon. So it, it, it sort of feels like this, this might have been a practice that maybe wasn't necessary 100 years ago, 50 years ago, but it is now highly necessary because of the environments in which we, we find ourselves in. That's right. Uh, uh, very well put. And, you know, the, the smartphones and internet are delivering experience in, at rapid speed in ways that the human brain um, just simply didn't evolve to contend with. Now, the, the human brain is great at dealing with new technologies, creating new technologies. Uh, what I'm describing are, are very basic practices that are designed to offset some of the damage, but also, you know, it, it's not just about avoiding problems. It's also about being functional. You know, I, I think that everybody wants to be mentally healthy, physically healthy, and perform well in their various activities. Um, and we do that by engaging the attentional systems and then disengaging the attentional systems. Everything in terms of learning, whether or not you're a child or an adult, is a function of being able to lean in with intense focus and then lean out and access rest of different kinds. In fact, I know we were talking about a respiration, but neuroplasticity, the nervous system's ability to change in response to experience, is what, aside from the fact that the nervous system anchors and coordinates all the actions of the body, the nervous system is so unique in that it can change itself. But unless you deliberately force specific changes onto your nervous system, the passive consequence of living in a particular way will also change your nervous system and not necessarily for the better. So excessive light viewing at night, not getting enough sunlight, not getting enough movement. I mean, the nervous system will atrophy or change in response to whatever you give it. That's the beauty of it, for better or for worse. And so what we're talking about here is, is leveraging the, this incredible capacity of the nervous system to change and saying, well, what are the simple, zero cost, low time, very low time investment tools that are going to allow me to um, be very effective as I transition from one stage of life to the next? And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of a lot of the work that's happening now in the clinical setting, I should say, around you know, far, you know, various compounds to improve plasticity or to open plasticity or some of the, I, I know that the pharmaceutical industry gets a tough um, rap and I agree that, that our, there tends to be this kind of default to pills mentality is not one that I subscribe to. Um, I think lifestyle factors are extremely important. I should mention that I do think that for a number of people, they are so depressed or the ADHD is so severe that the idea of doing the sorts of practices that we're talking about is kind of overwhelming. And, and that's something that unless someone has really been in those states, it's really hard to um, empathize with. But so we should keep that in mind. But for most people, I would say 90% of people out there, these are practices that we can simply do and we get an immediate benefit. But in addition to that, we get a cumulative benefit because I, as I mentioned before, these are slow integrative processes. So the, the it, day to day and across the year it accumulates. And then there's a third benefit, which is neuroplasticity, which is that your nervous system becomes very good at doing the things that are best for it. Yeah. So this is the, the systems of the brain that are responsible for being able to rest or being able to uh, de-stress or to focus, um, those systems actually get stronger so that your default is to be able to rest more easily when you need to rest, to be able to focus more easily when you need to focus and so on. And so that's unique. It's not just about putting pennies in the jar. You know, putting small small coins into a jar, you, you could say, well, eventually you accumulate a lot, but it's more than that. Those small coins are actually, in the, in the neuroplasticity model, are actually being converted into a much more valuable currency by way of that action. And so then what you find is after six months or so of doing some of these things, you feel much better all the time and if you miss a day or two, it's no big deal. Yeah. That's the that's the idea. No, I love that. I, I think that's just a great way to put it. Um, and, and I guess that there's that wider point that the the environment around us is affecting our nervous system. It is changing our nervous system, whether we want it to or not. So why not be intentional about some practices that are going to help strengthen it or or improve its functionality in a way that we want? Um, 
before we get to respiration and breathing, you know, one of the one of the things that I've heard you talk about before, Andrew, which has always um, struck in my mind, probably because I subscribe to this view as well, is you've said this, almost all of the unfortunate things that happen to us in life is down to a poorly regulated nervous system. I wonder if you could speak to that initially, um, because I think that really helps set some context for why vision or breathing or whatever it might be, why it's so beneficial. Yeah, so the um, like, let's take stress, for instance. We hear a lot of times that stress destroys our immune system, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, stress is actually the way that your immune system knows that it should turn on. Let's just think about the ways that our species um, got to where we are. There were long periods of time with bad weather, cold, babies that were undernourished, etc. Many of us are familiar with working very hard in school or just generally um, working hard or taking care of a loved one. And then you stop doing that, you finally get rest, and all of a sudden you get sick. Why is that? Well, because we have this incredible system whereby mental stress and physical stress causes the release of adrenaline, epinephrine, depending on where you live in the world, from the adrenals, live right above, which reside right above our kidneys, and adrenaline is the signal by which the immune system decides to employ killer cells, um, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines, or and also inflammatory cytokines, which can be beneficial for wound healing and things of that sort. So the activation of the stress system in the short term is actually very good at keeping us healthy. I'll just point to a practice that um, many people now do, which are cold showers, um, deliberate cold showers for three minutes a day, you know, three minutes every uh, two or three days, taking a three minute cold shower, and then it's fine to get into the hot shower, or um, doing what we call cyclic hyperventilation, which is just, <sighs> okay, both those practices, you might say, okay, what is powerful about a cold shower or cyclic hyperventilation? Well, there's nothing actually powerful about the them directly. I hate to tell people this, it's that they cause the release of adrenaline. And in excellent studies, peer-reviewed studies, it's been shown that breathing of that sort, and I, we can describe it in more detail, or the cold water exposure, the cold exposure, creates this adrenaline release, which then creates an ability to resist infection of different bacteria, viruses, and, and even um, fungal infections. A dramatic result. But it shouldn't surprise us, because we have a system that we are still the... We are here and we are the curators of the planet, not the house cats or some other species, because we have the capacity to lean into challenge and resist infection, heal wounds, and that is all mediated by adrenaline and the release of adrenaline is mediated by the nervous system. Now, when things go bad, for instance, people with chronically elevated adrenals, they're drinking coffee all the time and working like crazy, not getting enough sleep, psychological stress, they're not shutting off that system, then you start getting into chronic health issues, right? Because the stress system can't be um, chronically activated for too long or else you run into issues. But the nervous system coordinates that. Likewise, for people that have anxiety, we have to say, well, what is anxiety? Well, at a biological level, anxiety, stress, trauma, fear, and PTSD are all the same thing. It's ruminating on thoughts, but it's the release of adrenaline in a very unregulated way. And adrenaline has a primary effect, which is to make us want to move or speak. It biases us towards action. It's the quaking of the hands. It's the quaking of the voice. It's the quickening of the breath. It's the um, dilation of the pupils uh, of the eyes, which um, sort of counterintuitively creates a constricting of our visual field. It takes us out of the past and future and puts us into the moment so that we can you know, identify what's going on. So the, the idea is to take basic practices in, in the case of this discussion, practices that mainly anchor to vision and respiration and learn to control adrenaline release and the timing of that release. Learn to control it is a three, it essentially has three components. One is you can increase adrenaline release and there are times where that is beneficial and we can talk about that. Then you can come off the accelerator of adrenaline release. And then there's a third component which is to slam on the brake and shut down the adrenaline system. And the ways to do that are, uh, you could, people try to do it pharmacologically. They drink alcohol, they drink coffee, it has opposite effects on the adrenaline system, obviously. They use uh, sedatives and opioid compounds, um, but they also do things like take vacations or do meditation or 
um, get massages, which are all wonderful. Uh, the meditations, massages, and um, vacations are great. However, those all require that you step out of life. You know, I love getting a professional massage, but a professional massage is like $190, which frankly, even at my stage of life, I always feel like it's great, but you know, it's a considerable investment. I'm not gonna do it every day. I don't have a masseuse in my home. And to be honest, it requires that I not do something else. Yeah. Being a functional human and a functional human on any kind of budget means that you need to be able to turn on and off focus and relaxation and stress and so forth in a way that you are in control of that. And so when you start learning how to control your nervous system, it's tremendously empowering. And I don't think that people should not take vacations um, or not get massages or whatever it is, but the ability to control your nervous system in a dynamic way in short time scales, on the time scale of seconds, on the time scale of days, on the time scale of weeks, that's what leads to really terrific work and school and relationship and sleep and exercise practices. I just simply can't think of any other route to it. For instance, there's no liver detox that's gonna do that. There's no gut microbiome fix. Oh, the gut microbiome is very important, by the way, for reasons we could discuss, and as you know, and probably know more, far more about than I do, but there's no one tool or pill or potion or practice that's going to allow the whole system that is you to fall into place. Whereas if you learn to control your nervous system from the standpoint of attention, focus, relaxation, and sleep, and you use the appropriate tools to access those, then you find that everything else works better. Yeah. And that those additional tools of, you know, I am a believer in certain supplements. I also think, you know, people should eat fermented foods to improve their gut yeah. and reduce the activity of the inflammatome. There's great science to that. But that one practice isn't going to change everything. It's going to help, but controlling, learning to control your nervous system will indeed change everything. Your whole life gets better. Yeah. and in and yeah. mentally and physically if you enjoyed that clip from my podcast here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness i'm on a mission to get every human being to add one thing to their morning routine this takes five days to work before you have an enormous breakthrough in how you see and relate to yourself 